That's My Vinyl Answer interviews are brought to you by Make a Difference with Records. Based in Godalming, Surrey, we sell second-hand records and donate all proceeds to the charity Catalyst, who are best known for their mental health work. You can find out more about us at makeadifferencewithrecords.com. This is part one of a two-part interview with Tim Bonus, recorded in April 2024 and is available both as an audio podcast and in video format. We'd like to thank Tim for the generosity of his time and Matthew Johns Associates for hosting the interview. So my name is Anthony from Make a Difference with Records and we're here today with Tim Bonus, who is perhaps best known for his No Man uh, music with Stephen Wilson, but also has had a fantastically successful solo career. Um, Tim, thanks for spending the time today to see me. Much my appreciated. Um, I was kind of, you know, as you always do with these interviews, you look up a lot of things and then you look at the kind of history of all the disco- discography. Mm-hmm. And it's hugely prolific, particularly if you look at the last eight years. Yeah. Um, not just the solo albums that you've produced, all the collaborations you've done. Where does all that energy come from? It's difficult because to me it doesn't feel prolific. You know, when you're creating, I always find that every song is like the first song I've ever written. And there are periods, you know, during this period, the last sort of 10 years, where I've not written for several months. You know, it could even be six to 10 months where I've not written. But when I write, I tend to get fully immersed into it and a lot happens very quickly. So in some ways, it's a bit of an illusion that it's that prolific because in any given year, it might be three months of really intense creative activity and writing and maybe nine months where you worry that you'll never, ever write again. <laughs> so how, how do you keep fresh then in those periods where you're not writing? I tend to actually do a lot of re-recording then because, yeah, I think it's important to kind of keep fresh. So, uh, for example, during a lot of those periods, I did some re-recording with Plenty, which was my pre no man band which is fantastic because it's kind of a kickstart to creativity because you kind of realize where you went wrong those many years ago and you'll re- you'll end up rewriting tracks or re-singing them in a slightly different way so that's been quite useful the kind of period of reassessing and also because during prolific periods you'll come up with 10 ideas of which five you might reject and five yeah. you carry on you go back to those ideas that you rejected and think, you know, is there a seed of something? Uh-huh. And generally... That file marked do not touch or yes, whatever it exactly. might be. <laughs> um, generally, there's something that's kind of a, a kickstart to creativity again in those kind of abandoned files. And, you, you know, again, if you look at the sequence, it, it was very much dominated. If you go from your sort of, apart from your first album, 2004, yeah. the kind of early periods, if you talk about sort of the 90s onwards were really heavily dominated by No Man, um, and then you had what the Flame album with mm-hmm. Richard Barbieri. Yeah. And then your solo stuff came much later. W- was, was that a matter of confidence, or was that just a matter of, you know, you didn't have the time or the space to get into that earlier? I think it's a combination, really, of confidence, as you say, but also not perhaps having um, the equipment at my disposal. You know, at that point, I'd be recording in No Man's studio with Stephen or recorded in, recording in studios that I'd booked out for other projects. And um, generally speaking, it was kind of on location, whereas I think that in the last sort of 20 years, I got my home studio set up um, and I just started to experiment myself. So I think there's, there's an element of confidence, there's an element of having access to recording yes. spaces and recording yeah. equipment. Because in the 90s, I was kind of moving from London to Manchester, back to London, and yeah. staying a long time in, in other places like Dublin. And so I didn't actually have anywhere that was secure, whereas really from the early 2000s, I was living in Norwich and now in a place near Bath. So I've had you know pretty secure places where I can relax, record, do what yeah. I want in my own space, in my own time. But but yeah, confidence to a degree because, you know, I always kind of describe myself as, as the weakest musician I work with. So I'm quite you, content writing songs. Yeah, I mean, you've been really self-deprecating on that. And I was thinking about that. Because I, to me, it was kind of really weird hearing you say that. Mm. And then I thought to myself, well, well, presumably you mean weak in the sense of musical prowess on an instrument. Yeah. as Because your songwriting is sublime, so it can't be that. I think, well, I, I, know, I know chords, you know, keyboard, guitar, I can play, I know chords. In terms of actually being a player, I'm clearly, you know, as far from a virtuoso 
as you can get. So there's an aspect of that. So I'd always get better players yes. to an extent to replace my parts. Um, Do you find that frustrating then? Do you wish you could be more no uh, weirdly enough oh, i don't we don't have the time do you <laughs> um i don't because actually it's kind of it's very satisfying writing material and write and even co-writing material if it works there's a you know i, I find that there's, there's no difference really if i've written something completely or if i've co-written something yeah with stephen or brian hulse or whoever it may be there's a great feeling of of accomplishment if it's good, regardless yes. of where it comes from. Yeah. Of course, if you're doing everything yourself, there's a kind of a slightly different level of accomplishment. And, and there is still, I suppose this is why it feels fresh, that when I do these things, I listen, I think, good God, how did I do that? Because I kind of often forget, you know, there's a track, I'm trying to think now, from Stupid Things That Mean The World, that um, by my standards has an awful lot of chords and I remember writing this <laughs> and being stupidly satisfied you know of course if any probably guitarist listens to it they'll probably think you know what the hell has he you know what yeah, the hell has yeah. he got to feel pleased with but I remember at the time thinking good god 14 chords key changes and so on um, but again I got somebody um, who was a, who's a better guitarist to sort of play this for me um but, yeah, if, but so if it works it works i mean you know i entirely agree and i think a lot of pop soul country rock and roll actually yeah. has considerably fewer chords and considerably fewer changes than i would put into yes. material. so yeah so i realized that in terms of my writing skills it's certainly it's it's good enough for rock and roll yeah it's funny sometimes with the really stripped back songs that are kind of quite basic but they just really work because they're just beautifully crafted yeah sometimes i find if i'm listening to it in the open they just kind of wash over you but then occasionally i'll put the earphones on and you become rather more aware yeah of, of, of the fact that it is really going through very little in the way of change in that yeah i don't know what it is maybe it's just you hearing the instruments more clearly. well i think arrangement is very important i think you know basically I, i've always you know stephen kind of co-produced a lot of the no man work so i've always had an idea about arrangement you know stephen as well stephen is a good musician despite his protestations to the contrary but i can't believe he so. i can't believe he even thinks differently to be honest well, what stephen is superb at doing is being able to sort of mimic whatever he hears in his head or whatever takes his fancy in somebody else's music. Yes. So, for example, if he heard Django Reinhardt, he'd be the first to admit he couldn't play that Django Reinhardt properly, right. that piece. But he can delve into the essence of it okay. and pick it out for his own music. So he's a very intelligent and creative musician in that sense. And I think maybe that's, that's a quality that I hope both of us have, that we can just kind of access yes. what we feel we need for our own music. So I think it's more in the terms of, you know, he knows he's no McLaughlin, Steve Vai, Django mm. Reinhardt, yeah. but he knows he's good enough for his own work. And I think that on a level beneath that, I feel the same way. Um, and, and yes, you know, you're right that one of the things where I think that both of us have got a degree of confidence is in arrangement and production and also in knowing what's right for our musical expression mm -hmm. or our work. And also knowing that some of these virtuosos can make terrible music. Being a great musician <laughs> That's very true. doesn't mean you can write a great song. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean that you can make a great album. And so there are, you know, the, the world is littered with albums from virtuosos that are not good. Yeah, I mean, well, technically clever doesn't necessarily mean a happy experience as a listener, exactly, does it? Exactly, exactly. And also, and it's an album I'm not going to mention, but there was one particular virtuoso who made what they thought was a pop album. And it was so patronising because clearly it was this brilliant musician who thought pop music was just a sort of A, B, A, B. Yeah. And um, very asinine lyrics. And it was an awful, awful record. Um, so I, I, I don't think being extraordinarily gifted necessarily means you'll produce extraordinary music. I think that for me, it's always it's the core of emotion and emotional necessity that, you know, you feel this has to be out there and you feel yeah. you have to make it. Going back to your prolific question, I've never made music for the sake of it because there is so much music out in the world already true that we don't need to do this you know really you've got to put out what you believe in what you feel intensely yes. and what you think 
people should hear. Yeah, I mean, that, that whole intensity bit, I mean, personally for me as a listener, and this is a personal comment, um, obviously there's lots of music, you can just go and have a lot of fun and you're having a few drinks and it's on the background and it's very much background music, but for music, for me, where I want to experience the music has to move me emotionally. Yeah. And I know that you've talked a lot about the fact that you're driven by emotions um, when, you, when you write music. Is that remained a constant or has the level of that changed over the years as you've written more albums and collaborated more with people? It hasn't changed. I don't think I'd write if it did change. I mean, I'm aware of when things aren't quite as good as I want them to be. So, for example, if we're talking about my forthcoming solo album, this is a real change in that it's all me. I'm playing all of the instruments, I'm programming, editing. So I've written everything, music, lyrics, and I've played everything. And this was partly inspired by um, Brian Hulse, who I'd done my last couple of albums with, who was my co-producer yes. and in some cases co-writer. And with Butterfly Mind, I would say that roughly half of the tracks I'd written and brought in and then we got other musicians to replace my parts and half the tracks I'd co-written with Brian. And it was a really energising and wonderful experience. But I think he felt that he was neutering the energy of some of my demos and actually said, well, look, I think you've got to get this out of your system. You've done it for years, but you've yes. never released anything that's entirely your own. And he felt that the musicality of the people I got involved in some ways watered down the effect of the music. You're, so, talking, about, you're talking about Butterfly Mind now? This is with Butterfly Mind. He even thought with that, he, you know, he greatly enjoyed the process, I greatly enjoyed the process yes. as well. Um, but I was kind of, I think there are certain albums where I become even more opinionated and even more, well, I want this, this and this. So he felt that really I should just leave it to myself, and so well, I'd, I'd have no arguments at this point. It's funny, it depends, it depends on your perspective, doesn't it? Because as a listener, and being familiar with most of your solo work, um, Butterfly Mime was quite a big departure for me, but in a good way, mm. um, in that there was a lot more variety. I mean, there's some stuff on there. Is it is it the track, I can't remember the name, I'm hopeless at remembering tracks, but I think it's, is it called Feel Me? The, it sound, it, it's, um, let, me, let me tell you what the track is. See, I should know. Obviously. Well, you shouldn't. We, I, I probably have said it completely wrong. Um, I was close. We feel. Oh, we feel, of course. So, yeah. so for me, we feel could have come off Peter Gabriel's So album. I mean, it reminded me of the kind of closing section of side two, um, was it the birds and yeah, yeah. this is the picture, and, and I could hear elements of that, and then there were other stuff that was very much you, know, you from previous albums, and then we've got saxophone, we've got Ian Anderson. It, it, it's a real variety, fairly dark mm -hmm. from a lyrical point of view. Yeah. But as a listener, it was actually, to me, it was kind of you just pushing out. Whereas yeah. it's funny to hear you know, Brian say maybe it kind of restricted you in some way? Well, I think it, basically, I think it was pushing out. That's how it felt when I was making it. I think there was an energy. And I think that although the album, as a listening experience, can be quite upbeat, you're right, the lyrical aspect is quite dark. And it's something I've always Heavy. Kind of liked to <laughs> play with, really. And, and I think, certainly, Late Night Laments, which was a much more static album, yeah. emotionally and musically, and, and this album, which was much more diverse, were very much albums where I was almost kind of closing my eyes and letting the world seep in, if this makes any sense. It's almost yeah, yeah, that makes there was sense. the yeah. energy yeah. of what's going on yeah. outside. It was reflecting the kind of the tension, the turmoil of contemporary life. And I think one of the points you make about Gabriel is, is interesting because I now live in a part of the country that's very near Gabriel's studio. Yeah, 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 real world, yeah, yeah, yeah. And real world are my, are my publishers as well. 
And Peter Hamill, who was another big influence when I was growing yes, up, yes. lives here. And what I found interesting is that all of us live in relatively semi-rural, tranquil mm. environments. Yeah. And yet the music we've made since we've moved here is far more brutal, brittle, urban. And interestingly enough, I think that when um, Hamill and Gabriel were living in London, even when I was living in London, some of the music often had a more pastoral feel. So I think of Angel Gets Caught uh, in Beatty Trap from okay. Flower Mouth. It was almost like a yearning right. for what I didn't have yeah. in the heart of London. So I, yeah, I think it's a curious thing that I think my albums have got angrier. And in a direct answer to your question, which I didn't give, I think it's that I still feel in some ways, and always have done, um, unresolved, that there's this element that the music comes out of me because I've not fulfilled that gaping black hole that is somewhere inside me. You know, there's always something more that I need to gobble up. Well, you called it crea creative ADHD, didn't you? That was the label you gave to it. And there is a creative ADHD. So, so yeah, the, the new album, I think, is even more eclectic. And even, in, you know, in terms of musical genre, but also in terms of the moods it encompasses, because I would wake up and I would write and what I wrote was what came out on the album. And it's um, funny, you, you were talking about the home studio I mean, about five minutes ago. Yeah. Um, having that home studio gives you that ability to be very spontaneous. Yeah. So you can get these ideas and you can just go, oh, I've just got to do something with that. And there you are. Exactly. And so, you know, a very beautiful, tranquil ballad might be followed by an extraordinarily upbeat electro pop piece, which yes. might be followed by one of the most extreme noise dirges I've ever made. And partly it was because I was kind of fulfilling whatever I felt yep. that day, whenever I write. And it's always felt like that. I mean, and I think Butterfly Mind, as I said, I think half the material came from from me and it's kind of, it's my demos fleshed out with better musicians. So I think part of that eclecticism comes from the same energy that influences the new album. And part of it is because Brian was always a superb um, reader of my emotions. Yes. So whenever I yeah. worked on an album, so Late Night Laments, for example, which is very atmospheric. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd written a couple of pieces. I sent them to him. And then he would send me about seven pieces in the same emotional ballpark. Okay. He'd kind of read the mood I was in. And with Butterfly Mind, I sent him pieces that were all over the place. So basically, this is what I was writing. Even within the pieces, they were all over the emotional. Well, the spectrum. first track in itself, yeah. you know, gets from very quietness. And you go, whoa, what's happening? And then you go back to the quiet. Well, well part of that as well was written. I'd, I'd had a conversation. I'd, I'd had a coffee with, with Peter Hamlin. We were talking about the predictability of contemporary music, how right. everything is within the same BPM, and people rarely even change the BPM. And you could hear when the chorus is up. coming, and you you're waiting everything. for the bridge, and then you're back to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was this almost, I, I, I kind of, I'd, I'd come home energised by the conversation, and I'd written something in a way almost without time codes, mm -hmm. without mood, and it was like where this follows, where this happens. So in fact, within this short piece, there are three radically different yeah, time yeah, codes and yeah. BPMs and moods. The sickness is real It's all you can feel now like a deliberate um, reaction against a lot of contemporary music which unfortunately uh, and I really recommend everyone watches the Rick Beato videos on music where he talks about how contemporary music 
has become so streamlined, processed, even. so processed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so obviously, you know, if you're listening even to country R and B, rock music, they're using very similar set technology, very similar processing on the yeah, vocals. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's an absence of surprise, even with radically different genres. We're almost in some kind of homogenous monoculture when it comes to, to a lot of contemporary music. And that's not to say that there isn't great music being produced. I'm talking mainly on a kind of a chart basis. That if you analyse a chart song or a chart album from even 20 years ago, let alone 40 years ago, the number of chords used, the number of words used, the different tempos used, yes. things are becoming more and more yeah. closely yeah. linked. Music used to be about people chasing innovation. In other words, making a sound that no one else had made. Yes. Now it seems to be about everybody chasing what's been the last week's hit or the hit before that. Well, it's a, it's a hugely crowded marketplace now, isn't it? And uh, it's a hugely uh, and it, it's, in my perspective, is it's increasingly controlled. At least the, the, the big stuff is controlled by relatively few individuals. Yeah. And, and it's almost like people feel they have to fit in if they want to succeed, which is a real shame. There's a template that people follow. I think you're entirely right, regardless of the genre. And again, I think I, I was um, with my son in a trampoline park. And I was oh, listening I remember to those the radio. days. <laughs> <laughs> this is the weekend. And I was listening to the radio. And what was interesting is, again, whether they were playing a country artist, an R&B artist, or something that's at the top of the charts, how everything did have a rigid formula yeah. in a way that even if you listen to say let's say top of the pops 1980 and you have gary newman and earth wind and fire yeah the difference is staggering yes and also if you're thinking of something like earth wind and fire the level of complexity in their music and their harmonies yeah is astonishing by contemporary standards and i can't help but feeling or but feel that streaming has something to do with this in that People listen to music now in the way that 1980s A&R men used to listen to music. And what people have found, this is, sorry, what analysts have found, yes. is that a lot of music produced now that is doing very well, if you like, the top 1% of Spotify, it has no introduction. The songs are routinely 2 minutes to 2 minutes 20. Yeah. There are no key changes. There is a very basic two to four chord progression. Yes. And there's a very similar tempo. And this is regardless of genre. And I think that's interesting because it's feeding back the feedback that people are listening to this. So when they're listening on Spotify through streaming, they're perhaps not giving it the same level of attention or level of detailed attention that they used to give when buying CDs, when buying albums. Well, buying vinyl in particular. Exactly. So, I mean, you're describing what I call as the magpie culture. Right. Where people, the next shiny thing, and they're literally jumping around from one thing to the other. Yeah. And Spotify, of course, encourages that. Whereas the physical album, taking the album, taking it out of the sleeve, putting it on the turntable, it's almost, this isn't quite the right phrase, but it's almost a bit like a ceremony and yeah. the mindset that you get into at that point, I find, is really quite different. So I'm, I'm just wondering, do you think the resurgence of vinyl is potentially going to push that in a better direction or not? I think it already has. I think that, you know, resurgence of vinyl over the last 14 years, you'll find that the quality of vinyl pressings is better than it's ever been. Yes. Um, the quality of artwork and vinyl, you know, if artwork is lost on Spotify, you know, it's a tiny oh, centimetre. It's dreadful, isn't it? And credits, you know, the things that I used to be obsessed with, finding out where was this recorded, how was this recorded, yeah. what instruments were on. Which musicians were credited, exactly. lyrics. Um, yeah. And everything is lost in this world yeah. of, you know, two-minute identikit pieces. And of course there is good work. You know, again, I'm plain devil's advocate, and I'm speaking of the worst excesses of what streaming has encouraged. But... Um, I do think things have been lost, and you're entirely right that, you know, um, vinyl does encourage a different quality of listening. And I, I'd say CD, and I'd say as well, that, you know, once you've entered that mindset, you can listen to music deeply anywhere. You know, I'm sure there are people 
there are kind of teenagers who are listening to streaming and listening to the most eclectic, difficult music yes. in the most detailed way. So again, it's not necessarily the format. It's broad brush it's comment, what, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, what yeah, the format yeah. has encouraged and what, as you quite rightly said, is what lies at the 1% or the 0.1% of million, billion listens. I mean, I mean for, for, me, for me, they each have their place. Mm. I mean, driving up here, for example, connected the, the, the phone to the car, Spotify, yeah. I was able to select the albums I wanted to listen to, and, yeah. and uh, happy days. But, um, you know, it, it's when you get stuck in one groove and then you don't experience the other, yeah. and you never experience the album, particularly concert albums that have been put together with a story to them. Exactly. If people are just yeah. diving into a track because it's the most accessible track. Well, this is it. You know, I will still listen to the albums in entirety, and I'll still give it a chance. I think one of the things that maybe buying physical did was that if you spent money on something, you actually wanted to like that. So often something that might have been difficult or quirky yeah. or maybe just not in your mood at that point, you would give more and more times. And so albums that maybe I'm going to discuss with you later that are my favourites, I might have hated when I first heard them. Yes. But I listened to it because I've paid money, I'm going to listen to this even further. Um, or there was something in it that I was curious about. Yes. I love it. Yeah. But I was going to go back. And I think that obviously with streaming, you're right, it's kind of playlist culture that you maybe listen to one or two times and it's in the background. This isn't music in a sense as, um, as a kind of biography of your life, which I think, that music, you know, for me, music has, has always been so important, so crucial. Yeah. It's more than just a background noise in my life. Do you find it cathartic, writing music? Writing music and listening to music is cathartic, definitely, yes. yeah. Which do you need most, or, or, or both? I think both. I think that if, for example, I go through a period of not writing music, um, I get very frustrated. And as I say, I kind of fill that in sometimes with re-recording old material or trying to finish things that yeah. I never finished yeah. properly. So in order to put myself in that kind of creative zone, because, yeah, there's such a feeling when you're creating, and, and it is a feeling of catharsis, yeah. Um, we touched earlier on... Butterfly Mind, and I'd like to talk a bit about that in your new album um, before we circle back to a couple of other topics. Um, the um, contrast with that, with your earlier stuff, we've touched on yeah. um, already. The very dark, dark lyrics and the dark subject, did that come from a moment in time? Were you in a particularly bad place during that? or? Was it just something that you did? You put yourself in there imagining you were somewhere else and someone else? I think it's a combination, really. I think that, you know, as a person, you, you can't be unaware of what's happening in the wider world. And I think the wider world has, you know, over the last decade, become a darker, more dangerous place again. So yeah, I think yeah, that in sadly, some that's ways, true. my music reflects that. And what I find is that I go through kind of two phases really and one phase is where I reflect what's around me the other phase is when I try and find that comforting space inside me so even though late night laments is okay. quite political yeah musically it's very much of a piece you know I want to find that moment of calm and beauty in this chaotic world so I find that, you know, I can go through phases where the music I want to be extremely um, one note in a sense. You know, it's almost calming. And then there are times when I'm just kind of firing all over the place because I'm reflecting what I'm seeing around me. And yeah, as well, I think there was a sense that I was feeling kind of saddened and angry by certain things that were going on. Um, and it could also be as well that, you know, one of the things that's been quite inspiring during the period you call prolific is that um, I had a I have, chance to think, I have to think of a different word, won't I? But it's <laughs> it just on paper, it just looks, you know... Yeah, no, I, I don't six, disagree Six with albums you. in eight years, it's yeah, kind of, you know... I don't disagree with you. And obviously there's the no-man work, as you said. You yeah. Know, uh, love you to bits as well. Yeah, which we might touch on. Um, so, I, I think having a child 13 years ago as well, I think it makes you more aware of your own mortality, more aware of the fact you've not got that much time left 
to work in. So I think it, that's been yes. kind of a driving factor. Yeah, we've got to the stage where we're thinking, should we replace that carpet? You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, it, it yeah. rather, rather brings it home, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. so the ch children do that to you because they do give you a very different perspective yeah. and they give you a level of vulnerability almost. Exactly. I think you're right. I think there's a level of emotional vulnerability. I think you feel more on the edge. So certainly I would feel more on the edge Partly as well, because when you have younger children and you see that world yes. around, you're terrified for them. I mean, flowers, that, flowers are just seen. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of perhaps on point. You know, yeah. Some innocent gets stabbed. Exactly. I mean, that, was that, that must have been tough to write, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think to an extent, it, it was, this was a passing article I'd read in a paper and I fleshed out into a full story. Yeah. Because, of course, these things do hit you harder as a parent than they would have done otherwise. I mean, you, I've got a quote for you, and you, this is where you regret having done um, interviews, isn't it? You said that writing is an attempt to transcend this miserable life of ours. <laughs> <laughs> was that just a bad day at the office, or <laughs> is that really what you think? <laughs> What's next? Well... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I did have, it's funny because I, I always feel bad and I repeat it, but I did have, you know, because other people have got worse. But I had a pretty terrible um, adolescence. Yes. And I think this is when music became ever more important to me. But I think partly because of where I grew up in the Northwest, you know, you've always got to have sarcasm, a sense of humour, a sense of self-defence, all sorts of things. Yes, very much. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, uh, there is an aspect of that. I think that quote partly was because I'd read an interview with Stuart Copeland. Oh, yes. And Stuart Copeland said something that I thought was fascinating about the police. And it was, he said, you know, for me, I write to express the abundant joy and the ideas I've got. Okay. And so for him, the process of creation was actual total joy. And you can kind of hear it. You know, his playing is brilliant. He's mm -hmm. such an amazing mm -hmm. drummer and such an inventively sprightly drummer as yes. well. Yeah, and he said, whereas Sting had been brought up in the northeast, and perhaps had had a more troubled background as well, uh, for him it was to transcend the pain of human existence. And you can hear that. I mean, his voice in itself is, yeah. You know, when 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 um, I dance alone, I think it's one yeah, of his. Yeah. I mean, that is just pain. I mean, beautifully painful, yeah. but it's painful. When you hear it, the, the emotion is just pouring out of that. Exactly. So, so I thought it was interesting that both of them in the, the band coming from totally different yeah. places. And I think, you know, yeah, th there's an aspect of that. As I said, I think sometimes it's, um, it's that, you know, luckily I still feel unresolved. So therefore I still absolutely adore the process. Because, you know, we're talking about transcending pain, but, you know, the process of creating even miserable work... <laughs> can be can be wonderfully funny and wonderfully enjoyable. Well, again, I suppose it's a, it's a form of rationalisation, isn't it? A rationalisation may be acceptance, may be um, particularly things that you can't control. Um, yeah. I personally get quite frustrated for things that are bad and I can't control them. So say one of my children's in a bad space and I can't yeah. do anything about it other than talk to them. That That's a difficult thing to do. And sometimes, I don't know what you find, but with music I sometimes find... It, it's just recognising that maybe you listen to something and not the only one in that situation. Yeah. Or even just giving you a moment to have that wallow because you're in a bad place and you need to be in a bad place for a period yeah. of time and then come out the other side. But it's quite funny how music sort of, f so many different purposes and so many different kind of emotional pulls. Indeed, yeah. And, and as I say, you know, I, I think it was important to me before my adolescence, when I fell in love with music, I think I've, I said this before, it was, it was in the cinema when my dad used to get me in underage to see James Bond films. <laughs> and I adored the John Barry soundtracks and then oh, yes. his work with, you know, the Quilla Memorandum and other soundtracks, Midnight Cowboy. He was such a composer. So when I was at primary school, John Barry was my musical hero, whereas everyone around me loved, I think it was, you know, the the Sweet, probably. Oh, and, so um, we're talking early 70s then. Sweet, early mid -70s, Slade, yeah, Sweet, Slade, Chicory Tip, yeah. etc, etc. Um, and really, it was at the end of primary school that I heard kind of pop music that really touched me, and that would have been 10cc, Sparks, Queen, stuff like that. We'll, we'll, we'll probably come on to that in a bit more detail when we look at your kind of chosen yeah. records and albums, I, I suspect. But yeah, there was an element of 
too cool for school there, wasn't there? You kind of you, you had to be careful what you were admitted to yeah. liking, didn't you? Uh, well, I just had John Barry albums and Jeff Love plays John Barry. Jeff Love. And Jeff you, Love you admitted yeah. that in the open at school, did you? Or Yeah. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, that's one of the things I think basically, I don't know if it was being an only child, but um, luckily I could sort of live in my own world and create my own yeah. world. Uh, fantasies and, and music art and I didn't really care if what I did didn't fit in and by the time I'd sort of reached secondary school luckily I found other outliers and misfits and we all f- formed a gang yeah, yeah. Um, and so it, it just didn't really bother me you know I had people running out of my house screaming this isn't music to things I liked so um, I was used to it. Oh, I, I, I think that's brilliant you did that and uh, there's something about childhood innocence where people have no constraints, no boundaries, they, yeah. they're just experiencing and they like what they like uh, and I think increasingly now with modern music I think people are more willing to say well I, I'm sorry I like that. Yeah yeah. Which you know. I think, this, I think it's partly because there's no consensus at the moment really. I think whereas there was a consensus during that time, you know, with pop, um, even during the time of punk or metal, there were groups that had a certain taste and there was a consensus. And if you were out of that consensus, you were the... Well, it was a, there was a big divide, wasn't there? Prog yeah. versus um, punk for a lot, of that, a lot of that period, which again, we might, we might yeah, touch yeah. on later. But, you know, which camp were you in? We were, both. We were the cool guys, or we were you with both, or yeah. Well, for me, it was it was always kind of both because for me, it was always music. So I found things yeah. of value in pure pop, disco, punk, progressive rock. It was whatever hit me emotionally, and I think there's great stuff in all of those fields. That's one of my great regrets, actually, as a, as a young child, which I'm making up for now that we've started this record um, store. It is I, I think I was very constrained by what was cool. Right. And also very constrained by what my parents thought was music. Okay. You know, the old, you may, you may or may not have experienced this, but you'd put something on and go, what's that noise? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I kind of almost just wanted to fit in because I came from that very conservative background. And it's very liberating now to be able to kind of go back to things that you, yeah. you never really experienced, you never really listened. And, you know, my musical taste was probably quite narrow then. Yeah. And it's, it's become much wider as time has gone on. Well, I think, I mean, my parents really, you know, they had a fairly small record collection with some things that I um, did enjoy, but generally there wasn't much appreciation of what I liked. It was very funny what my dad did like. I remember for some reason he really liked The Cure's 17 Seconds and Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here. There were these two albums. <laughs> That's that an interesting played, combo. He would come in and say, that sounds good. Yeah. Which yeah. I thought was very peculiar, you know. Um, but, yeah, other things he would just dismiss as um, utter rubbish, obviously. So, so if we come back, we, we talked a bit about Butterfly Mind and, and we touched earlier on the new album that you're, that you're yeah. writing. Um, you said you've done it all yourself yeah. and you've also talked about it being very varied because a lot of it was spontaneous. How do you make an album like that, that varied and yet there's a, there's a core, there's a flow and an essence to it or do you not worry about that? I think it's one of the most difficult albums I've done in that respect in that... Um, I mean, basically, it followed a period. So when I'd done Butterfly Mind, I really felt that was one of the, the best things I'd ever done and that it, in some ways, kind of satisfied lots of sides of my musical curiosity. And it was a bit like when I'd completed Together With Stranger with No Man, that that so successfully delved into a particular area that I loved. I felt I couldn't write anything almost for a year. Right. Because that did almost fill the void. And to a certain extent, Butterfly Mind was similar. Is it quite exhausting then, the way you just described that? It sounded Aspects like it was quite... of it, yeah, when you'd finished it, I think you feel, felt exhausted. Butterfly Mind felt like a conclusion, which also included Flowers at the Scene and Late Night Laments, but it was almost like the absolute conclusion of what I'd been doing on those albums. And I did kind of co-write a few pieces with some people. And it just, I didn't feel it was good. I didn't feel I was putting, you know, to to me it it felt like I was treading ground I'd worked in before. Um, So this is outside of your solo stuff, this is collaborations. It could have been solo stuff, you know, but yeah, it was Because you did some joint writing on um, Flowers at the Scene, for example, Rainmark. Rainmark, which is probably your nearest thing to a pop song. That was my I wrote heard. that one. That was all mine. That was all that was yours, was it? Yeah. So I think Matthias gets the credit for some reason, if in that case. But I think. But oh, I think um, he gets credit for playing on it. I think. Ah, on Spotify, okay. 
It, I think it's one of those things where the record company put his name on because they believe there'd be more listeners. <laughs> but yes, that was a solo. But that, that's kind of you at an upbeat. I mean, the lyrics may not necessarily yeah. correspond, but, but as a melody, I mean, that's a pop song, isn't it? The rising of the sun The crumbling of the moon it that I found that what I was contributing myself as in the songs that I'd written were often the most upbeat pop songs and the bleakest pieces so yeah Rainmark for example but then the opening of Butterfly Mind is also mine so I think mine really were in old terminology quite schizophrenic in terms of the right. emotional territories they operated in I mean another one I think from Late Dight um, Laments, um, I'm Better Now, for example, that was mine, um, which is certainly on, on the bleak scale. Um, but anyway, yeah, so there are people... I interrupted so you, so sorry, we were, yeah, we were so talking I, about how you get the flow and the essence of the album. Yeah, so album. I'd written some things, probably in that nine months, I'd done a couple of plenty of re-recordings, which were really enjoyable. Yeah. But then I'd done some co-writes that really weren't going anywhere, and the music I was being sent to write on, if you like, or right over, wasn't doing very much for me. And this is at the point when Brian said, well, look, you know, why don't you just do what you did on the other side of this? But it's you, it's unfiltered. Yes. And that really was a trigger. And maybe it's because it's coming up to my birthday. I just started writing. And then when I'd started writing, I couldn't stop writing. Okay. So over a period of three months, I wrote 16 pieces. Yes. Then there was a gap. Then there was another period of two months where I wrote another 10 pieces. And so there were real flurries of activity. Yeah. And the music was extremely diverse. And so I'd left myself with a, with a fairly difficult job because I had 26 pieces. Oh, wow. I'm hearing a bonus CD at this point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that were extraordinarily diverse. Lyrically so, diverse as well, or yeah, lyrically diverse as well, but certainly musically extremely yeah. diverse. You know, I, I can say with absolute conviction that on the new album you will get a couple of the hardest hitting, darkest things I've ever done, and a couple of what might be seen as the most lightweight, frothy pop songs I've ever written. Okay, so that contrasting um, because this is what came out, plus some quite direct. Um, acoustic guitar singer-songwriter pieces because these are things I've always written as well and never really recorded. I've never really recorded me at the guitar doing my back to basics Bob Dylan singer-songwriter. Okay. And there are a couple of examples of that on this album so it really does um, go through quite a number of moods and styles. And is there a theme to it from the story point of view? Or? Possibly not, no. Whereas Late Night Laments, there was very much a theme. And to a certain extent, with Butterfly Mind, there was a theme. Well, this. Lost in the Ghost Light was probably the one oh, with the big, much, biggest theme. Yeah. I mean, that was a story. That was, a, I think, probably a concept album, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd say it was, definitely. Yeah. Um, whereas this very much was just kind of following um, the mood of the piece or what I was writing around at the time. I mean, you do find things come through, you know. So, for example, I wouldn't have said it was autobiographical. And then I'll realise that two or three tracks, there are very strong autobiographical elements or elements related to members of my family. Yes. But while I was writing it, I didn't think about it. Yeah. In retrospect, by God, is it obvious, you know. Um, so well, if, yes. if you're being uh, spontaneous, which is what you were talking about, yeah. that's, that's because it's bound to happen, isn't it? Because it's Indeed. coming out of you. Yeah. 
Um, and if you said, it, it, if you've got this mixture of reacting to things in the world, which is about a specific topic or theme perhaps, yeah. but then things that are with you emotionally, I mean, you know, when you hear that back, yeah. you're going to hear echoes, aren't you? Yeah, very yeah. much so. And I mean, there are certain themes, you know, there's a kind of, there's a site eco-apocalypse theme going through a couple of the pieces because um, a few of the pieces kind of revolve around characters who almost lose their way possibly on the internet characters that have become radicalized if you like by what they're seeing by what they're reading and I'm writing it from different perspectives so it's people who are radicalized in a right-wing way people who are radicalized in a left-wing way because right. I think that the extremes politically can both be as unreasonable as one another on occasion. And, and knowing, knowing um, what's true at a very basic level yeah. is becoming increasingly And I think difficult. knowing what's true, so again, if, you know, I think the internet, unfortunately, and this is something we might do in the second part of the interview, when you're dealing with mental health, the, the internet is not a help because if you have certain issues, you can be driven, you can be driven by, um, echo chambers obviously you can be driven by certain extreme points that just chime with how you're yes, feeling on a particular yes. day and you can end up in a kind of internet nether world if you yeah. like you know this kind of rabbit hole you go through so we're going to get a very varied album sounds like it's even more varied than butterfly mind for example are, yeah. are we going to be hearing a bit of the kind of mood that we heard on the Love You To Bits, which which was, well, I think it was fair to say it was a bit of a shock for some No Man fans <laughs> when they first heard that album. I mean, for, for me, when I, fir I first put that album on, and I thought, what the hell is going on? And then I, I did what I'm not always good at, which is I stopped myself and said, just let it wash over you, give it a couple of listens. And I'm mm. now at a place where I, I really appreciate it. Right. Um, because there's a core and an essence of both of you still in there, albeit it's very different. I love you to bits I love you to pieces I love you like I don't love you at all Musically, is this album going back in that direction, or not necessarily? I mean, one thing I'd say about Lost, um, sorry, Lost in the Ghost Light. Uh, along with Lost in the Ghost Light, I think Love You to Bits is um, my one concept album, my one true concept album, because that is reflecting on a relationship from the perspectives of the two yes people involved. Excuse me, from the two people involved, and also from a perspective that they share. So there are almost three different yes, views on that yes. album. And I think it follows the course of a relationship from joy to questioning to desolation and end. So I'm, I'm really pleased with that album kind of as, as an emotional statement as much as a musical statement. And I really like the fact that we managed to make something that was quite energetic and breezy, but still had substance, I hope. It, it, well, it did, and, that, and that's, that was the thing that took perhaps more time than some of the other albums when I listened yeah. to them. And it, it took that period of kind of realising this was quite different. But then lyrically, lyrically I thought it was incredibly strong. I mean, some of the lyrics are relatively simple in the sense of it's clear what the, you're, you're yeah. saying. Some of the other lyrics you write, you're kind of thinking you can interpret them many different ways. Yeah. But the... Simplicity is not the right word, but let me use it. The simplicity of the lyrics mm -hmm. kind of matched a lot the, yeah. the musical tone in some of those, I thought. I think lyrics always have to match the music. I think one of the things I've always felt, lyrics are very, very important to me in terms of artists I like, in terms of my own work. But I'm well aware, in terms of what I listen to as well, that a great lyric can't save a terrible piece of music. Similarly, or vice versa, a brilliant piece of music actually can work with a terrible lyric. No, I actually think I think if a if a if a piece of music is wonderful, if a song is great and the melody yeah. is right, the lyric can be as banal as anything, but it still has that emotional impact. So as much as the lyrics okay. are important to yeah. me, yeah, I'm aware you've got to write for the piece. So sometimes a piece needs something quite simple, quite direct. Yes. 
and then perhaps it's in the verses that it becomes more complicated. So I've never really overwritten lyrically. For me, I think it's really important to kind of match the melody. So melody and music have always come first, and then I've matched the lyric to that. And was that was that true even of Lost in the Ghost Night? Because the, yeah, the, so you 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 didn't have the story and some headline tracks lyrically before you wrote the music then? I did have that. No, I did. I think what, what was great was that with that, I'd written a couple of pieces and that was, um, there were quite a few co-writes with Stephen Bennett on that album. And Stephen's yes. a wonderful musician. And basically with Stephen, because I had the concept in my head, I gave him pointers. So this is where perhaps having the musical skill is important. I knew what I wanted to do and where that character had come from musically. Yes. So I would say to Stephen, okay, listen to this, listen to that. Can you incorporate aspects of this music? And he'd come back to me with some brilliant sketches that were mm -hmm. exactly what mm -hmm. I'd requested. Pieces that I would struggle to write. Yes. Because I've just not got that um, particular ability. And so I had the concept in mind almost from the beginning. Um, but yes, I, always the melody would come first, but then I would fit the lyrics to that melody, but it was working within the frame of the concept, which I had pretty strongly mapped out from the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the concept was very strong. It was a guiding light. And, and, and sometimes when you've got that guiding concept with Love It To Bits and with Lost In The Ghost Light, it's actually great because you know exactly where you're going with the song. Yes. And strangely, even though it's about somebody who isn't me, especially in Lost in the Ghost Light, you find yourself emotionally involved. I don't know how, you find yourself emotionally involved in the mm -hmm. character and taking that further, and it almost becomes like writing a novel, that you're kind of, you're getting deeper and deeper into this person's life. But I always work within a kind of a structure in the same way that I guess that poets work within a quatrain or work within pentameter if they're writing a particular type of poem. Yes. And of course, great poems can be written with strict form. So weirdly, it wasn't um, a problem. It didn't get in the way of the story. And the story was, was always in the background. In fact, funnily enough, since I finished the new album, um, I've written a follow-up story to Lost in the Ghost Light, where oh, okay. the character went after those songs. What, as a pure story or to, as, well, at or the to moment, be put to music? It's um, song titles, the story, what the actual song titles relate to in terms of, okay. of the story within the yep. particular lyric. Um, so it's the direct opposite, because I think, as I said, what I find is that with music, it, everything you do is almost a reaction to what had gone before. So Butterfly Mind was a violently eclectic reaction to Late Night Laments being very much an atmospheric one note type of album yes um, and in the same way um, I think then the new album was an even more vibrant continuation of Butterfly Mind it's so energizing but because that was all over the place suddenly the next album I feel I want to focus myself on and I know exactly what I'm doing okay so so, so you haven't even got the most recent one out and you're already thinking about the next one yeah well, the most recent <laughs> one... Uh, so so the, the title of the new album is... Uh, it's going to be called Powder Dry. It's going to be released August the 2nd on K-Scope Records okay. this time. I've moved to K-Scope. And I finished it this month because I think it took me 30... Because I had 26 tracks to play with. Yes. It took me 30 attempts to get the sequence right. Because, again, album sequencing, I know that people... It's a bit like playing a live show, isn't it? You've got yeah, to get that absolutely right. So. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's really important. You know, I listen to albums in the way that the artist intended. And for me, I always take an awful lot of time structuring how an album is put together. And sometimes it means you drop your best tracks. Sometimes it means you drop the piece that has got a really powerful mood and you feel is one of the greatest things you've done. But it goes because for some reason the flow is not right. But that, but that's what the Ben CDs are for. Yeah, that <laughs> that's true. what they're for. Or it's what the next album's for. Or the next, yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> they, true. They become the key for the next album. But yeah, so I dropped about 10 pieces from this. And um, in answer to your question as to whether it explores Love You To Bits, I'd say no. I mean, there are certain pieces that are gonna surprise people. 
maybe because of the violence of the track, maybe because of the unpredictability of the track, yeah. maybe because they've never heard me be a straight singer-songwriter before. And yes, there are a couple of moments that probably have that extraordinary lightness and bubbly popness of Love You To Bits. There are okay. some moments of that on the album. Well, very much looking forward to that. Um, Given how busy you've been, I'm assuming that there isn't a No Man album on the horizon as well then? No. At, at the moment, no. I mean, we've been doing album years together a lot and we, we get together, you know, fairly frequently to do this. It's been hugely successful, that podcast, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, in some ways more successful than we thought. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's kind of been globally successful as well. And what's interesting is when I go to gigs people will often talk to me as much about the album years as they will about my solo albums or no man's so yes it's become a big thing and I, and I guess that started in the pandemic and it was because Stephen had decided to delay the release of his album and he said do you want to do a podcast so for about a couple of days we did brainstorming of what the podcast should be and once we did it you know the, the one idea that was always through it was that we wanted to give back to music what music had given back to us yes enthusiasm yeah yeah so we've tended to be more um optimistic than pessimistic when we're discussing the future of the music industry and our relationship with music although i think that as it's expanded and the podcasts have got longer we perhaps become more and more ourselves unfiltered really well, unfiltered is a good thing, I think, for the listener because they get the real they get the real deal, yeah. as opposed to something that's compromised and compromised things tend not to be. It was never compromised. I think it was never compromised, but we always focused on what yeah. we knew we yeah. we liked. Whereas now, I think we're giving kind of broader views of things that you know we have issues with and why we have issues. But you know, we we, we don't ever want to get into that kind of music journalist territory of criticising because it isn't cool or criticising. Yeah because we don't like it. You know, we, we've never been of the school where if you don't like it, it's rubbish. You know, because it isn't. Because there are things that I don't like that are clearly brilliant and there are gifted songwriters that just don't connect yeah. with me. And are you going to be touring on the back of the release, do you think? Or is that too early to say? Definitely doing some dates, yeah. And, good. and also there, will, there may well be some album years dates as well. Oh, good. Excellent. So. Well, listen, that brings us to the end of part one. Thank you so much for your time. And... Um, Join us in part two for to hear about um, Tim's musical influences. Yeah, my pleasure. That was part one of this interview with Tim Bonus. Part two is available now as an audio podcast and on our That's My Vinyl Answer YouTube channel.